Okay, now I'm recording. I'm recording. Elizabeth, I give it to you immediately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Oh, wait, actually, I was just going to say hi. Did you want to introduce me or should I just begin? You can begin. You can begin. Oh. What, I, what I wanted to say that I, I admire your work for, for quite a long time. And then, then when we met at the, the Mesa, then, then I heard uh, your, your, your talk and then we had a discussion and, and I was sure we, we will all benefit from from this immensely interesting uh, topic of slavery and and on how to research it, which is not that obvious. So yes, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks everybody for coming and uh, and thank you, uh, Ishvan, for inviting me. And I'm looking forward to having this, you know, be slightly more informal than in what I might normally present um, on a research talk because I'm starting with some stories about myself and I'll tell you a little bit about my current research and then I'm looking forward to the Q&A as well. So I'm just going to begin by telling you a little bit about myself and how I came to um, Islamic studies, essentially. Um, I'm originally from Texas. And growing up in Texas, um, the part of Texas I'm from, um, people, you know, this is before 9-11, but people spoke negatively about Islam um, as the kind of stereotypes that you're familiar with, right? That it's misogynistic, that it's violent. Um, I grew up in a, a very highly evangelical Christian context, and I just became aware of the ways that all these people who would speak bad about Islam um, were kind of using it as a scapegoat. They weren't interrogating their own traditions. They weren't interrogating their own texts. They were just kind of offloading all of their criticisms onto Islam. So, for example, I used to play the violin in, um, in a quartet, and I would get money in high school by playing at weddings. And I witnessed so many people, um, evangelical Christians, getting married, um, and the the preacher would, you know, they they would recite these Bible verses that said things like, you know, women will be subservient to men and obedient to men, and women are, uh, men are the head of women, like uh, Christ is the head of the church. And then they would turn around and say, oh, Islam is so patriarchal. So I kind of, uh, you know, even as a teenager, kind of got this idea of. There must be something else going on here. There must be something um, deeper that I'm missing or that the people around me are missing. So I went to college to study religion. I was a religion major. And uh, I was very curious in the ways that religion inform people's lives and in the way that um, people interpret their religions and the, the kind of diversity of practice and belief within any one religious tradition. And I particularly studied pre-modern Islam, and then I studied Enlightenment era German Jewish philosophy. And as you know, my in college uh, career was ending, uh, first of all, 9-11 happened, and I became aware of you know, the need for people to be educated about Islam. But I also kind of thought, well, which of these two paths is going to be more likely to you know, get me a job? Um, so it's sort of some practical questions involved there because I'm very interested in you know in all religions and all faiths and so I said you know what I'm going to study Islam um, and so then I began to study with Fred Donner uh, for graduate school in in the University of Chicago and I'll, I'll return to this theme in a moment but you know again I'm, I'm very interested in all I just find you know religion and faith to be beautiful and fascinating so I was happy to study Whatever part of Islamic history uh, that was open to me, I just happened to start working with Fred Donner and so then focused on the early period. Um, but there was also a little bit of a cowardice <laughs> in my choosing what I wanted to study. And I'll get to this more in a moment, but I kind of wanted to study Islam and to educate people about Islam without ever having to answer questions about the Israel-Palestine conflict, the Iraq war that was happening at the time, 9-11. I basically didn't want to have any current controversies that people asked me about. I just wanted to talk about thousand-year-old texts and leave it at that, which turned out both, I think, to be cowardly on the one hand, but also naive on the other hand, because it turns out when you study Islamic history, people assume that you know everything about this entire almost 1500 year history. And they asked me about the Israel-Palestine conflict nonetheless, and they asked me about uh, the Iraq war nonetheless. So kind of realizing that I was perhaps trying to avoid controversy in a way that was not realistic and was not 
uh, brave also. Um, and then to kind of jump off of that a little bit, I wanted to take this moment, you know, Ishtvan, when he invited me to speak here, told me that I could speak about, you know, anything that, that people might find useful or in, enlightening or, or helpful about their careers, especially speaking to uh, students, though anyone, hopefully. Um, but I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how I have struggled with the, the challenge of anxiety as a person and as a scholar. And I imagine that many of you might struggle with anxiety. Many students struggle with anxiety. Um, and for me, I, I have some social anxiety, which doesn't usually come out in something like this, right? I feel pretty comfortable talking to people. I feel pretty comfortable talking to audiences, but it comes um, more in other situations like not wanting to talk about things that are controversial, right? And I've had to do a lot of work to be brave and to kind of subdue my fight or flight syndrome when talking about something that might be controversial. Um, it also happens with things like speaking Arabic. Um, I'm not really fluent at speaking any foreign language. I've studied a lot of them. I'm pretty good at reading quite a lot of them, but it's just, you know, I, I got to see, um, I got to see the talk last week and um, he just talked about how many languages he could speak and I just thought, I just can't, I can barely speak English fluently because uh, I have some haltingness to my speech because of social anxiety. So I used to have a real chip on my shoulder about my inability to speak Arabic really fluently. Um, but that's partly just because I, you know, I just, when I don't, speaking is not my number one way of working through ideas. Writing is my number one way of working through ideas. So when trying to work through an idea in a language that is not my, my native language, um, and putting myself in situations where I'm not totally sure if I'm saying it correctly, or if I'm speaking to a lot of strangers, or I'm having to answer questions on the fly, not in a prepared way. That's just not um, the situation where I'm going to thrive the best. So I used to have a real chip on my shoulder. Oh, why am I not more fluent? And now as I get older, I just thought, you know what? We all have strengths and weaknesses. My strengths are in reading and writing. My weaknesses are in speaking. I can always work right with the idea of growth mindset. I can always work towards speaking more fluently, but at some point I just kind of have to accept what are my strengths and weaknesses. And then the other thing I'll say, hopefully this will be useful for students where my social anxiety um, can rear its head and where I really have to practice is with job interviews. Uh, I'm comfortable with, again, what, somehow speaking in front of a group is not frightening to me, but the, it's the formal question and answer interview part of interviews where I feel like there's a script and everyone knows the answer. Everyone knows the script except for me. And I'm trying to keep 20 scripts in my head because the students want one thing and you know the undergrads want one thing, the grads want one thing, the department chair wants another thing, the dean wants another thing. And I'm trying to like get it right instead of saying you know who I am and what I do. I'm trying to try to read everybody's minds. And so this, um, you know, doesn't always go well for me. <laughs> so if those of you who are hoping to be on the job market are someone who struggles with, you know, I, I'm also not a really quick thinker. I like to think of myself as a slower, deeper thinker. But if someone asks me a question, even during the Q&A today, I might have to take a moment to think about it. I don't just have those ready-made answers right on the tip of my tongue. And that just makes it tough. So, you know, because I did want to do well in job interviews, I would practice and practice and practice. I would go on long runs and you know you know the questions you're gonna get, right? So I would just, I would practice answering the question um, as I'm jogging down the street. Um, but then, you know, there's always the, you can't prepare for every single question. And they you know, they ask you the one question you're not prepared for. And my response is just kind of like deer in headlights. Let me think about that for a minute, you know, and so just um, there are ways you can improve for those of you who are wanting to, you know, go into academia or any job interview, you can practice. Um, but then also just kind of my suggestion and I have if you have questions about this, I'm very happy to talk about it. I feel no uh, shame or stigma about talking about my anxiety, but um, just kind of, you know, practicing growth mindset, even if it's not something you're ever going to be amazing at, you can get better. But then if it ever does not go well, it's not the end of the world. Take a deep breath, 
you're a you're a valuable person, uh, however well you perform at, at job interviews. Um, so that was the, uh, really what I wanted to talk about uh, about myself. Oh, and, and and to bring it back to the controversial issues, you know, I've had to do a lot of work. The my my dislike of speaking about controversial issues is also an anxiety um, issue, where basically. My anxiety tells me that the stakes are really high and the consequences are really dire for even small stakes things, right? So talking about the Israel-Palestine conflict, for example, um, someone's gonna be mad at you no matter how you present that topic, right? So it's like my worst nightmare, someone's gonna be mad at me no matter what. And just kind of, you know, doing the, the work, the spiritual work, the therapeutic work to the emotional work to, realize that the consequences are not actually that high um, in the say like a teaching setting, for example. Okay, uh, that's all I had to speak about myself. Um, now I have some research stuff to present. So let me share my PowerPoint. So my talk today is entitled The Challenges of Studying Slavery in Early Islamic History. And um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit, you know, my, my scholarship, uh, my book that recently came out a couple years ago, Conquered Populations in Early Islam, tackled the way that new Muslims of slave origins, you know, participated in, articulated their identities within and changed early Islamic history. But it became really clear um, after writing that book that there was a lot more to be said about slavery in early Islam. Uh, I, there's other many other scholars who have studied slavery in the Islamic tradition, for example, Jonathan A.C. Brown, uh, who I saw in the audience. Hi, Jonathan. Um, has you know recently written a, a book on slavery in Islam, Bernard K. Freeman. Um, there's a lot of people who have written on slavery in Islam, but there hasn't been a whole lot of sustained discussion on the early period, other than the Quran, right? There are people who are who write about the Quran and what does, you know, how it was the presentation of slavery in, in that text, but less so in the period of the conquests and the Umayyads. I suspect, though I'm not totally sure, I would love to hear what you think, that some of this is due to the um, problematic sources for this time period. And I think it also is partly to do with the fact that people like to skip over the Umayyads and get right to the Abbasids as the kind of quintessential classic medieval caliphs. So um, in the current project I'm working on, I'm still in the very early stages of it. I'm um, trying to write another monograph on freedom in early Islamic history more broadly. Um, and so one of the challenges of studying slavery in any period is, well, what do we even mean when we talk about slavery, right? And, and y'all will be familiar with this, but my students, you know, always only have in mind one form of slavery when they are answering this question, which is modern American chattel slavery and transatlantic slavery. But um, once you start studying this topic in a more global and uh, trans-historical sense, it becomes really clear that Slavery is an amorphous thing. Is it a legal status? Is it a social position, a lowly position? Is it an embodied experience where you experience degradation, for example? And what characterizes slavery? Whenever I ask my students this, what is slavery? They say it's little or no, no pay for your labor or it's forced labor. But what about things like access to legal rights, agency, the issue of ownership? Um, is that the most salient aspect of slavery or not? What does that entail? Is it is it violence? So what, so what is slavery? This is already something that is um, a challenge to answer. And for the early Islamic period, the challenges get more specific. So for example, um, early Islamic law is familiar with the categories of free and slave, but there are a lot of what we might consider intermediate categories or um, kind of categories that that kind of straddle free and slave. For example, the mukatab, um, someone who has a um, 
contractual right of manumission that they're working off, uh, paying what we would call indentured servitude, right? They're working towards a contract of freedom that they've made with their master, the mudabbar, uh, someone who has been um, kind of promised to be set free upon the master's death, the ma'dun, a slave who has basically been given executive powers by the master to run the master's business as he sees fit, for example. The um walad, um, concubine mother um, or enslaved mother of the master's child who is automatically, according to most schools, freed upon the master's death. Um, and is, again, it depends on the school, but is, is um, released from certain kinds of household labor and is expected to dress in certain ways that are familiar from, for, for free women. And then my beloved complex category, Maula, um, the freedman or freed person who nevertheless retains some legal obligations to the master and some legal dependency to the, to the former master. And so all of these categories kind of challenge the simplistic view of, well, you have slave and you have free. So one of the um, frameworks that I've been working towards using, and that's what I'm, this, this current book project is kind of about how do you apply this concept in a, in a systematic way of unfreedom. Unfreedom um, takes the focus away from slavery as a legal status and, and this kind of binary of, well, you're either slave or you're free. And instead it focuses on enslavement and other forms of unfreedom as a relationship between let's say the enslaved person and the enslaver or the master, uh, excuse me, the, the patron or the client. Um, it's characterized by asymmetrical dependency, basically hierarchical, it's a, it's a mutual relationship, but a hierarchical one where one party has more power than the other, but they both are linked together in, in intimate ways. And again, unfreedom presents, um, we have more of like a, a continuum of statuses or a continuum of experiences rather than a binary of slave and free. That also allows us to deal with the complexities of certain situations where an enslaved person in Islamic history might be extremely powerful, uh, might become the vizier, for example. Um, you know, it doesn't say like, if you're a slave, you have to be lacking agency. And if you're, and you're free, you, you have to have all the agency in the world. It allows you to kind of parse out the differences. Well, what does, what can a maula do that an enslaved person can't? What can a child do that an enslaved person can't? You can parse out the differences between all these different forms of dependency. Again, enslavement, um, freed person status, serfdom, um, childhood, marriage. You can parse out what could this party do that the other party couldn't, who was in charge of enforcing these boundaries, what were the expectations of these people, and you're viewing it always as a kind of a social relationship. However, um, I was recently at a conference where some challenges to this idea of unfreedom were raised. One is simply the worry that it is euphemistic, that what we really mean is slavery, and we should just call it slavery, uh, it's unfreedom is this kind of euphemistic way of getting around slavery. Or if we are truly using it to mean other forms, not just slavery per se, but let's say patriarchal marriage, then the, the challenge is, well, does it take away from slavery per se? Does it allow us to equate enslavement with other things that we shouldn't reduce to enslavement, for example, uh, marriage? Right? Does it say, well, we don't really need to talk about slaves per se anymore because there's other forms of unfreedom that we should study. I, I think that these um, are important challenges to raise for unfreedom, um, especially, you know, it, it could be expanded to the point of kind of nonsense in the sense that, well, everyone is unfree in some way, shape or form. I can't just do whatever I want with that, you know, without any consequences whatsoever. So we're all unfree in some ways. So does that just mean, okay, well, you can study anybody and anything under the rubric of unfreedom. So I think, you know, that's why the idea of it being, a, you know, highly asymmetrical dependency, where one person's agency is very largely curtailed, for example, is might be a useful way to limit what, what it is we're calling unfreedom.
But for me, as someone who especially has studied the Mawali and the Mawlayat, unfreedom simply works better than slavery because these people were slaves and now they are freed. They still inhabit some kind of a dependent relationship. Um, and I find that unfreedom is useful. But I'd be really curious to hear in the Q&A, what do you think about this idea that unfreedom is euphemistic, it takes away from slavery per se, or that it becomes so broad as to be meaningless? So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about some of my current um, research, which is on a, the Maulayet. Um, let me go back because I don't want you to get distracted by my slide just yet. Um, I'll go back to this here. So uh, my first book really focused quite a bit on the Mawali. Um, these, you know, it's a chameleon of a term. It can mean freed slave. It can mean convert to Islam. It can mean, it can also just mean brothers, friends, brothers in faith, faith friends, cousins. Um, at some point it becomes glossed as non-Arab Muslims. So that was really what my first book was kind of parsing out the meanings of the term Mawali and using how that term shifts in meaning to understand some of the changes that early Islamic history were going through, and then also to compare Mawali to other groups like um, the children born of Um Walids, for example. But I realized that a lacuna in my own research, as well as in that of most other scholars on the topic, perhaps all other scholars on the topic, has been the Maula, the, the Maulayet, that is the female Maula. In my book, I, I spoke of prostitutes and enslaved women as being, in some ways, the an analog to Moeli. But I realized, well, there actually is a, a literal analog to Moeli uh, uh, of, among women, which is the Maulayat. I think there are several reasons why these women have not been studied as much as men. First of all is simply the, the uh, recognition that Mawali played a really prominent political role in a lot of the, the texts that focus on high politics. Um, they played military roles. They acted as bureaucrats and viziers and things like this. So the Mawali and scholars, right? Many of the early Islamic scholars were Mawali. And so they attracted that attention for that reason. But I also think um, another reason is that Simply, there are there are so many more Mawali in in our texts than Maulayat, but there's also so many more Jawari, that is enslaved women per se, in the texts. So I I don't know if I might just even turn off my sharing for just a moment so I can see y'all because um, I'm mostly just talking to you here. Um, Maxime Romanoff created this fantastic ingram reader where you can uh, look at all the digital texts that have been digitized by the Kitab project and you can do a search for particular terms and it tells you how common particular terms have been over time as categorized by the text in that corpus. So I don't know if any of y'all have ever used the Google Ingram reader where you can basically check all Google books, all the books that have been digitized on Google books for the prevalence of certain terms and see, oh, well, this term was really hot in the 1980s, but it's really dropped down today. Well, you can do the same thing for all the texts as they've been tagged and marked up in the El Kitab project. And I did a search for Maula, Mawali, and found you know, a lot of hits, excuse me, in early Islamic history. And I also typed in Jawari, Jaria, Jawari, and found a lot of hits. But you type in Maula, and Maulayat, and you just get much fewer hits than either of those two things. So it's I'm still thinking about what this means, and I'm still, frankly, working on my digital history um, methodologies. I'm not a digital historian. I'm working with some students now to help me think about, well, what are the methodologically rigorous ways to use texts like this? But it suggests to me that when we're talking about kind of the realm of unfree people, Mawali are more likely to make, or we should say men are more likely to make the historical record to be entered into the historical record when they're freed rather than when they're enslaved. Whereas for women, it's the opposite, that women are more likely to make it into the historical record when they're enslaved rather than after they've been freed. Um, and so just thinking about the kind of underrepresentation of, of Maulayet throughout the sources. Uh, so I think that's, that's one of the reasons. 
Um, okay, so let me go back to sharing my screen. So I've been doing some pre preliminary work on Maulayet. I've been using El Maktaba Shamila to, um, again, to kind of do these searches where you can find all of the references to Maula or Maulayet in any given text. Because if you do something like a search for Maula Mawali in a text, you get a thousand hits. But if you do Maula Maulayet, you get like 50 hits, right? And so it's much more um, possible to kind of do a comprehensive analysis of, for example, how does Ibn Sa'd talk about Mawali, or, or excuse me, Maulayet? How does Atabari talk about Maulayet in his tafsir and in his tarikh, right? How does uh, Abd al-Razzaq talk, talk about Maulayet? You can kind of get a comprehensive picture of how these authors speak about these women. So just for example, um, again, Ibn Sa'ad has about 30 um, Maulayet mentioned. Many of them are in the Isnad, right? And so, and they're usually in the Isnad at the, the final, link in the chain before they they transmit the hadith. So that is to say they're someone who either knew the Prophet Muhammad or they knew one of his companions and their intimacy, their relationship of, of dependency with within the early community allowed them uh, intimate access and gave them this authority to be able to transmit the hadiths and to, and, and to transmit the accounts, not always hadiths, but uh, accounts of these companions of Muhammad. Um, but there are a few accounts uh, that are about about Moali as a, a, a Maulayat, as opposed to being transmitted by them. So, for example, here's a story. It's it's transmitted uh, by an un, unnamed Maula of the Umayyad Caliph Omar ibn Abdulaziz, and uh, she faces his wrath after she takes a scoop of milk curds from the the food kitchen, the Dar al Sadaqa. Right, and so she, this Maula is bringing these curds to Omar's pregnant wife, and we never learn in any of the women's names. But Omar catches her taking the milk curds from the kitchen, thinking, "What are you doing taking? You're like, I'm the caliph. What are you doing taking from the charity kitchen?" And she explains, "Your wife is pregnant, as you know, and when a pregnant woman craves something, she fears that if she doesn't get that thing, she will lose the child in her belly." So Omar grabs this woman by the hand, marches her home and says, if the fetus can only stand to eat food for the needy and the poor, then God can't stand the fetus. Meaning if, if, if the child, if the, the baby in his wife's uh, belly, you know, uh, doesn't survive because it doesn't get this um, lab, uh, laban, then God didn't will it to be in the first place, all right? And so he repeats the statement to his wife and then his wife tells her maula, return it woe upon you, I won't taste it. So I'm, I'm interested in this account because it, first of all, we see some of the, the domestic work being done by a maula. She's um, taking care of uh, this woman who's pregnant and it seems like a lot of these women are either wet nurses or their midwives and, 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 or you know, caretakers of, of mothers and children. And when we also see her, you know, being the one who leaves the house to go get the things for the wife, who presumably is staying at home, is, a, is an elite woman who doesn't have to leave the house. So we see this domestic work. We see her traversing the permeable boundary between the home and the public world. Then I'm also really interested to see that even though presumably Omar's wife is the one who said, oh, I'm really cra craving leban. Can you go find me some leban? When the maula gets it, but then gets in trouble, now the wife also says, return it woe upon you. Like, you know, she, I'm, I'm fascinated that the wife presumably is the one who sent her on this errand and is also the one who's basically saying, shame on you when they get in trouble. Um, so the, the maula becomes kind of the, um, the receptacle or the, the recipient rather of, of chastisement. Um, and there are several other accounts that are that are similar to this. We see women cooking. We see women um, doing kind of intimate um, labor, like plucking body hairs uh, of off of men. Uh, there's a story about a woman who who plucked Ali but Ibn Abi Talib's uh, armpit hairs, for example. Um, and Ibn Saad, I, I'm I'm still working on this. It's all I'm, I would really love to hear your thoughts because this is all quite preliminary, but um, Ibn Saad presents these women as caretakers, wet nurses, midwives, doing domestic labor. 
but also presents them as being really intimately tied up in kinship uh, encounters or kinship bonds. And this is how I um, originally began kind of thinking about Melody. I'm just going to stop sharing the screen for a moment. Um, because I presented at a conference on kinship in early Islamic history. And um, wala in classical Islamic law is presented as a form of kinship. Al wala luhamaka luhamata nasab. That is, it's a, it's a bond like nasab. It's a bond like mm, paternal patrilineage. So I was really curious to see, okay, in what ways is it like kinship? In what way does it function like kinship? Um, and, you know, one of the things that we found in that conference is that when we talk about kinship, we're not just talking about descent. We're not just talking about an ideology of who is related to whom and who can marry whom. We're talking about a functional um, daily lived experience of who do you have daily interactions with? How are you connecting between this household and that household? Um, kinship has a, like a really functional intimacy uh, of interrelatedness in everyday experience with through things like cooking through things like celebrating of holidays together, sharing a household. And it was in doing this research that I found that Ibn Saad presents these Nawalayat as truly kinswomen in the sense that they are intimate members of the household, they're doing this labor, but as they're able to traverse that boundary between the home and the, and the public and to go into other people's homes, they're connecting some of the elite families in early Islamic Medina. Um, so for example, you find a story about a, um, a, a maula belonging to the family of Ibn Abbas, who's going around and visiting rel uh, other families uh, related through marriage to Ibn Abbas. And so we see that she's the one who's kind of um, keeping the ties between these families physically connected. Um, so that's the way I, I, I argue that Ibn Sa'd presents these women as, as very highly intimately related as kins, kinswomen, essentially. But then we're, there are other kinds of texts that treat them slightly differently. Like for example, and I would really love to hear about uh, your thoughts on this because um, I don't consider myself a scholar of Islamic law. I'm working on it. I'm, I'm trying to get uh, improve my skills and methodologies in that realm. But I am currently writing um, a piece on Maulayat as presented in Abd al-Razak's uh, Musannaf, and then also Ibn Abi Shaiba's Musannaf, so two early um, Islamic legal compilers, basically. And um, Abd al-Razak, in particular, has a lot of stories that hinge upon Ma Maulayat, and there are things like this. So Hatib said that a Maula of his called Markush began to say that it was illicit to commit adultery. Omar asked Ali and Abdurrahman ibn Auf about her, and the two of them said, give her the hat, that is to say, stone her to death. Then Omar asked Uthman about it, and he said, I see her declaring it lawful as if she doesn't know that it's not lawful. And the had punishment is only for people who know that what they're doing is wrong. So Omar agreed to flog her and did not stone her. So flogging is the punishment, uh, you know, classically given to enslaved women for committing adultery, um, whereas free women um, are stoned. And so here we see a woman who, even though she's technically freed, she's a maula, she's receiving the punishment due to an enslaved person. So again, we see the um, challenging of this kind of binary between slave and free here, uh, and more like working with, well, it, what is the similarity here between the enslaved woman and the maula? In this case, it's that they don't, no, that they haven't been acculturated yet or taught yet or educated yet into the correct morality of, an, of a free woman. And so we're going to be lenient in this case and give her the punishment of an enslaved woman instead of a, a free woman. Um, other examples from Abd al-Razak, it's, it's really interesting. I'm still trying to parse through it, some of the difficult legal language, but he presents Maulayat <clears throat> excuse me, as kind of, um, I say, tricky legal cases where you have a situation where the lawyers really have to use all their ingenuity to figure out, for example, who is related to whom. So for example, there's a story about two 
Maulayet sisters. And so they're freed, they're freed women. And one of these two sisters manumits her own father. And then after that, the father manumits his son, the brother of the two women, right? So we have two free women, they manumit their father who then manumits their son. Then the, the son dies and the father inherits from the son. But what happens when the father dies? And Abd al-Razak decides, well, they both inherit as his daughters, but then the one who actually manumitted him also, manum also inherits as his manumitter, but not the other one. So they're trying to parse out, okay, manumitter, daughter, sister, how are Baulayat uh, related here? They also deal with situations where uh, let's say someone has died and a, a maula has died and has left behind a master, but also a uterine half brother. That is to say her enslaved mother's son. So she has a, a mother, a, a, a sibling through her mother, a, a brother through her mother, which of those inherits and, and the opposite too. What happens if a maula dies and her father has a daughter? Who, who inherits first, the thought, like the half sister, we'll say half sister through her father or the master, right? So he's playing with like, okay, Maula is a tricky legal category. How are we supposed to understand who inherits from whom when we have all these different layers of, of inheritance, right? Um, so I'm really curious about, let me go back to my sharing screen. like teaching. How do I share my screen? <clears throat> so I'm still working through um, this kind of material on Maula yet. I'm I've just today I've presented about Ibn Sa'ad and Abd al-Razak, but I have looked at several other um, texts that I'm, I'm really working through trying to get a sprinkling of different authors and different genres to see the, the way that genre and authorship affects the way people present. Um, these women. So for example, as I said, Abd al-Razak treats Maulayat as kind of tricky hypothetical legal cases. Ibn Sa'ad presents them as intimately tied up in these household networks. Um, and for example, Tabari barely mentions them at all in, in, in his tarikh. And that makes sense because Tabari is interested in kind of high politics, right? As, a, as opposed to Ibn Sa'ad, who has quite a few of them, relatively speaking. Um, so I'd love to hear any thoughts you have about ways I might approach to the Maulayat, um, things that you find interesting about Maulayat. But now I wanted to end with one last bigger um, kind of theoretical challenge or uh, existential challenge of studying slavery in the early Islamic period. Um, and especially here, I want to recognize my positionality as a white Western non-Muslim scholar and to kind of recognize the ways that academia has been steeped in Orientalism and other kinds of colonial and hierarchical thinking. Um, and I, I want to be very attuned to this when I study slavery in, in early Islamic history. So I've really been, again, going back to the social anxiety thing, how can I do this in a way that's ethical but also isn't gonna get me into hot water, uh, <laughs> um, maybe it's not something that I should be worried about, but I just, I, you know, again, I have some anxiety around controversy. So there's a part of me that really wishes, <clears throat> excuse me, oh, I'm gonna stop sharing because it's all just this picture. Um, you know, what is the, the scholar of history's job? Who is our audience? Um, whose job is it to, avoid misunderstanding and racism and Islamophobia? Is it, is it my job or is it my audience's job? So, you know, slavery is such a very fraught uh, topic. It, it brings up a lot of emotions for people. Uh, people think of it as literally the worst uh, thing that you could possibly do in all of history. The, you know, greatest moral sin of all time is to have enslavement. Um, I see this with my students, for example, in my, my kind of lower level world history survey, I'll often have my students do a kind of a creative assignment 
where I make them based on a kind of a creative reading of all the primary sources we've done for the ancient world, create their own ancient society and kind of present it to the class and enact their own ancient society. And the first couple of years I did this, I had my students had war, patriarchy, pestilence, but they refused to have slavery. They said, oh no, our society doesn't have slavery, we abolish slavery. And so the next couple of years I had to say, no, your, your, your society has to have slavery. Every ancient society had slavery. You can't, you can't avoid this issue by just saying, no, 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 we just don't have that. Um, and so instead have to grapple with why did these societies have slavery? What, what role did slavery serve, right? So it's this great moral evils to the point where my students will accept war and patriarchy and death and pestilence, but they won't accept slavery, right? So I'm, I'm very aware that this is an emotionally fraught topic. But also it's a topic that has, again, deep history in Orientalism, in people associating Islam with slavery. Um, groups such as ISIS um, and Boko Haram don't, you know, help matters in this regard. So, you know, my students who are very widely ignorant about Islam have come to associate it um, with, again, with misogyny and violence, but also, also with slavery. And so, as a scholar who's studying slavery in the early Islamic period, I really want to be attuned to not mm, add fuel to that fire or to not add um, fodder to, for people who think that already is, they, they already associate Islam with, with slavery, um, who are already looking for just another quote unquote bad thing to associate Islam with. But on the other hand, I'm a medievalist. Medieval societies had slavery or unfreedom, right? Even those that didn't have technically slavery, they had serfdom or they had patriarchal marriage. So it's just kind of a historical fact that these societies had, had, had slavery. So I kind of sometimes feel like in terms of being a socially anxious um, scaredy cat that people are either gonna misunderstand me as trying to, you know, kind of further an orientalist project by saying Islam and slavery go hand in hand, see? Or um, on the other hand, um, to, to kind of be insulting Islam as a religion by focusing on the enslavement aspect. Whereas I think of myself as a historian who's simply trying to parse out how these systems of power operated and how they changed and how they shifted. Um, and then, so it just kind of makes me wonder as, as a teacher, as a writer, as a scholar, Am I speaking simply to other scholars? Because if so, other scholars often find it it's, goes without saying that all societies had slavery, that I'm not conflating Islam and slavery. Like I, you know, I've sometimes gotten feedback on articles I've submitted of like, yes, 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 we all know that. You don't have to say that. But for my students, I de definitely do have to say that. Um, and so how do you, how do we, and this is kind of an open question for, for you, how do we, navigate wanting to educate in a rigorous and scholarly way, but without kind of exacerbating current day prejudices, current day power imbalances. Should we write differently in journal articles, for example? Obviously we should, but in, in what way should we write differently in journal articles than in monographs, than in our teaching um, about such topics? And so this is something that I, I kind of grapple with as someone who wants to study early Islamic slavery, uh, because I find it interesting, because I find power dynamics interesting, um, because I find social change interesting, but wants to do it in an ethical way that that doesn't, um, you know, that kind of recognizes the long history of, of Orientalism in academia, and that doesn't exacerbate what is still, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard for me to believe in 2023, my, my first year students who take my intro to Islam class still just, they don't know anything about Islam. They don't know that Muslims worship God. They don't know that Muslims don't worship Muhammad. They just don't, they don't know anything. And so it's kind of like, how can I study this topic in, in an ethical way while also being attuned to the different needs of different audiences? So that's, that's what I've got for you today. So I would love to hear any questions, thoughts, comments. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this, this splendid talk indeed. Uh, and which you finished 10 minutes early. So we will I have know, I was to... a little 
plenty like of time. I like to err on the side of short rather than too long. But. We will have plenty of time for a discussion. Um, before we 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 do that, uh, well, just one one very one very obvious comment for for the, the discussion is that that of course slavery today in the West is everywhere. <laughs> So we have millions of millions and millions of people who who are who are slaved, and the, well, yeah, it is illegal more or less. But it's it's it's, it's still, of course, there. So um, it's not a unfortunately, it's not a dead topic or or not a topic which we could restrict to any any area or or era. Right. Well, that I makes mean, your research still, even more. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. It's still incredibly relevant. And talking about that um that emotional, emotionally fraught bit of it, you know, people I my politics are on full display, but I, I think that mass incarceration as it's practiced in America is a you know a modern permutation of slavery. And so, but yet when you say that, you know, depending on the politics of the students in the class, you can go, oh no, it's not, no. We don't have slavery. And so, but you know, what if we don't call it slavery, but we use unfreedom to look at the ways that it is really functionally operating in many of the same ways that slavery did in the past. But in, in any case, to your point, yes, it's still completely relevant. It's still, you know, all over the place. We just don't call it that anymore. And and then, also also the this this uh this large question of unfreedom or freedom. Well, it starts with the question whether we have we have free will at all, so so, and then then you zoom in into 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 specific uh, slave slave uh, uh, slaveries, um, but it may be very useful to to have this this background and the the, the term for for believer like abd slave. So it's it's not um, anyway. What I wanted to 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 say before, which is kind. Of, uh, reflections to the first first part of, of the talk is that uh, you I, I um Elizabeth I know you translated um, um, the Risala fi Sahaba by by Ibn Mukaffa. There is something in the Kitab al Adab Kitab al Adab al Kabir which says that um, people are different in a, in in about everything uh, in their opinions on everything. How could you expect that they would agree on you? <laughs> so, so that's unfortunately we all want everyone like us, and we want well, at least and many of us, we would like that, and we would like to, to, to make everyone happy. I, yeah, it doesn't work. And and another funny thing, which which is also a common um, a, share, a common friend of ours, told to me that she she went to an interview. And then, uh, then she a job interview, and then uh, she was asked, uh, and and uh, her specialty is, is early early Islam and philosophy and such things, and then she was asked about current issues, and she replied that would would some would would you ask a scholar of Plato to explain the current uh, Greek uh, economic crisis, and they wouldn't. But in, in the case of ours, they do. <laughs> they always do. So yeah, yeah, there is no escape of that, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, well, now I talked really enough or more. But one more thing is that to advertise the next talk, which will be by Dunya on, on music of the spheres in Akbarian, Akbarian, Akbarian Sufism. So I promise it will be excellent. So uh, please, please register and and come. And now I will stop the recording and invite uh, for your questions. <laughs>